If you turn uh, in your Bibles to 2 Samuel, chapter 23, I want to read a little bit around the key passage tonight, um, give you a little background. <clears throat> you know, it's, 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 an, it's an amazing and a mysterious thing that, one, that God chooses people. It's also plain from the scripture that he has always chosen a small flock. It's not, it doesn't make sense to the world. They can give you a hundred reasons why they should, he should choose their nation, their people, their this, their that. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, you saw the hatred of the world against the Jews as a picture of, of that same kind of hatred against God and against his Christ. It's, um, you know, it's, it, it doesn't make sense to the way the world thinks about it, but it, it, it makes sense from the Word. You have to see these things in the Word where, where, you know, there's a clarity about what God is doing. And some of this is uh, what I'm going to address tonight. Uh, in Second uh, Samuel 23, the... David is basically on his deathbed, and he writes these last last words, and uh, they're quite interesting. I'll pick up on uh, in verse four, and he's he's talking about the the Christ that's his hope, and he says that he that's the Christ to come shall be as the light of the morning, and the sun when it rises, even a morning without clouds as the tender grass springing out of the earth by a clear shining after rain. He goes, although my house be not so with God, yet he's made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns and thrust away, thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands, but the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and a staff and a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. So the thing that I'm going to focus on tonight is, you know, David's comfort that everything's ordered and sure by God, that all things are going exactly according to God's plan. I've got the other verse there, Revelations 180, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Uh, he, he says, um, he, he is who was and is and is to come. He's the Almighty. And everything is ordered and sure. He sent his son to die for his people. As it says in Matthew 121, as we read this morning, speaking to Mary, call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. It's ordered and sure. The Christ of God came, born of that virgin, walked the walk of men, went about doing good, as it says in the scripture, uh, the hatred of men upon him, because he told them the truth of the word, the truth of, of his father. Uh, and, uh, and upon that tree, they slew him for the sins of his people. That was all ordered and sure. And you could see that in Acts as well. In fact, just where Chuck was, if you turn back there in Acts chapter 4. Just another snapshot of how everything is ordered and sure. Where we were reading in 4 verse 27, uh, it says, uh, for of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, everyone is gathered against him. He goes, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Everything was ordered and sure. They put him to death thinking, here's our victory over God. All they were doing was exactly what God intended them to do. Because it was ordered, it was sure. And it was all the salvation of his people, as it says in Second Samuel. It was all their salvation. Turning back to Second Samuel 23. For this is all my salvation, all my desire. Where it says, make it not to grow. Uh, you can read that different ways. It may mean, it most likely means he's saying that the Christ isn't here yet. He's yet to come. Uh, it could also mean that uh, other, other things. But we'll just stick with that. Um, 
I also noticed, this is a side note, if I was chasing a rabbit, I'd chase a rabbit and notice uh, how do you deal with the people of this, of this, since the topic came up, the people of the world. It says some of them, they're referred to as sons of Belial. And they're like thorns to be thrust away. It says you can't even touch them unless you unless you wrap yourself with iron and a spear. It says unless you're covered with the word, be careful who you deal with. Because they're like thorns and briars. They got they got a different idea. They have a hatred of this God. Um, in Isaiah 46.10, I've got the verse written out there. You see the same concept that everything's ordered and sure. This God declares the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I'll do all my pleasure. So you think about that, and you start putting it in your life and in your head, and you start thinking, Okay, I've got a boss. The boss doesn't like me. Ordered and sure. Okay, I've got a boss. The boss loves me. Ordered and sure. My neighbor is bugging me, ordered and sure. Um, I'm failing in, in this class, ordered and sure. I'm succeeding in this job, in this class, this whatever. It's order. It all is. Everything runs according to God's timing and according to His plan, and you can take comfort in that. You can take comfort in that. Now, the sovereignty of God. I've said this before that. There are a lot. There are a fair number of people in this world that believe God is sovereign, who don't believe the gospel. This is not um, the the, the uh, beginning and end of the gospel. What this is, but it is a certain fact that everything is going according to God's timing. It will end up in the way He intends it to end, and uh, and 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 in every step in between. I remember reading Top Lady one time, and he was commenting on this, and he was saying, you know, there's not so much. You know, you ever. Have you ever been in a room where it's dusty and the sun comes in the window and you can see these tiny little particles in the air? Tiny little particles. Top lady was saying there wasn't a one that moved that wasn't ordered and sure by God exactly where it was moving. Just to really drill it down to the very detail of your life. There's not a speck. You get in a car crash on the way home, ordered and sure. Okay. You become the president of the United States, ordered and sure, whatever it is. So for God's people they can take comfort in, in that his sovereign purpose and plan we've seen how it worked through Christ we see we've seen that he fulfilled all of God's his father's desire to come and save his people we saw it certain that even though the world was opposed and did all they could against it it all failed it all failed and Christ succeeded uh, and he, he has saved his people from their sins as it says in Matthew in Daniel 4:35 um, you, we read this many times but turn there again if you would to Daniel the hard the hard part about seeing God as sovereign is not understanding that that, that God is capable he's omnipresent omniscient uh, everything works according to his purpose the hard part is when things go don't go our way still believing that and saying it relates to everything that's happening in my life right now that's the hard part <laughs> it's easy to believe in concept now that God rules over all and Daniel 435 says all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, "What doest thou?" So, this is the God that we worship, a God who does according to His will in the in the army of heaven and right here on earth. Every day, every moment, every minute, He's in sovereign control, and that gives the believer uh, great comfort. I can remember when I was in this uh, Southern Baptist Church when I was first a college student and uh, I did a short time at one particular church and the preacher was this firebrand preacher. He'd get all excited and do all sorts of things and invite people to Jesus and weep all about it and all this kind of stuff. And one, of the, one time uh, someone in the church died and the person apparently hadn't chosen Jesus as his savior. And it so upset the whole church and that the, the, the preacher said, don't anybody talk to the family about it. 
because he didn't trust them to say the right words about what was going on. That's how. That's the madness of this world. They can't come to grips with the fact that uh, uh, God's will will be done, and that it's His choosing and choice that. Uh, is that me? No. Okay. <clears throat> that uh, that He doeth in, in 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 heaven and earth what He will. And who can say, what doest thou? Uh, so in, turn to uh, Psalm 37. So I want to talk about comfort the believer has in God's sovereign purpose, walking day to day in this life. And in Psalm 37 verses first 23, it says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. They're ordered and sure. And he delights in his way. Uh, though he, he fall, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Now, uh, that relates certainly most certainly to the believer and the, the purpose of God in their life that the, their steps are ordered by the Lord the Lord delights in his people though we fall though we fall and when we fall not if when we fall it says not utterly cast down for the Lord will uphold him by by his hands now that also in the larger context speaking of the Christ of God, that the Father delights in his way, and though he be slain and put in that grave, he will rise again. He will rise again. But I, in, in the life of the believer, though, uh, when we fall, we're not utterly, we're not cast away when we fall. We're not utterly cast away. We have, because it's not based on our work, but on his. If, if the Lord were to judge us uh, on our, our good behavior when we fell, He'd cast us aside. He'd cast us aside. Inadequate, insufficient failure. Cast him aside. But when the Father looks at those who believe in the Son, he, his love toward them is on the basis of Christ and on Christ alone. And therefore, when they fall, they're not, other, they're not cast down. They're picked up. They're picked up because the Lord upholds him with his hand. That upholding never goes away. Turn to Jeremiah 29. In Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, this is, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. There's this love towards his people, that there's going to be an expected end. Or a certain future. There's, it's all ordered and sure, uh, and that uh, the salvation worked out on Calvary has worked the work it's intended to work, and uh, the end of that is to the good of His people. It says, it says in Romans eight and verse twenty eight, all things work together for good. The, the love of the Lord, and the call according to His purpose, and that the believers can give should give thanks in in all things and for everything. How can they do that? They can do that when they rest upon a God on, on the rock of Israel who rules all, reigns over all, and is most interested in the most minute detail of your life. No matter how small, those his people's concerns are his concerns. If they fall, they won't utterly be cast down because he upholds them with his hand. That's great comfort to the believer especially when bad things you know bad things happen 
People die in your life. People walk out of your life. People turn on you as enemies. Uh, loss of favor, whatever in the world. Loss of possessions, loss of this, loss of that. Just loss. To be able to worship in those difficult, difficult times. You know, when David uh, was told that uh, Bathsheba's child was going to die, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed that God might... to keep the child alive he didn't and he submitted to the sovereign sovereignty of God in the matter after the child died he, he uh, cleaned himself up and went on about his business and blessed God uh, the world's response to uh, to this is I've, I'm merging two two messages here I was talking to Chuck about this earlier, earlier in the week I'm going to merge two messages and they're, they're the same but they're a little bit different how does the world respond to the gospel? I've noticed this over the last 15 years or so. That the way the world responds to the gospel is if I don't hear it, I'm not accountable for it. Don't tell it to me. I don't want to hear it. I'll give you an example. I have a friend who, uh, well, I'm not sure where he's at now. I know he's in Austin, Texas, but he was a, a, an executive at a big company. And he had bad news. He had to give the president of the company, who was a super big executive. And he, the, his boss knew that he had bad news to give him. And so his boss literally tried to run away from him in the airport because he did not want to talk to him because he knew that if he talked to my friend, he was going to hear something and he was going to be held to account for it. And he thought, if I don't hear it, I can never say I knew about that. And therefore, I'll, I'll not be held to account for it. And it, it, was, it, it, it was almost embarrassing for my friend. He had to literally chase him into a bathroom and say, listen, I've got to tell you this. We've got a problem, and here's the problem. And uh, his boss uh, didn't want to hear it. It wasn't, it wasn't the right. But I think the world is the same way. The, I'll give you an example. Turn to, uh, to Matthew 22. If they don't hear this, or if they can shrug it off or turn their ears off, then uh, all's well. In Matthew 22, you see a little bit of this, beginning in verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son. He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, that they would, but, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I prepared my dinner, my ox, my fatlings are killed. All things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it. This ain't no big deal. I don't want to be involved. I don't want to know. I don't want to participate. Therefore, I'm guiltless but they'll not be he said they went their ways one to his farm and others to his merchandise I'm so busy with what I got to do got money to be made everybody understands that he says uh, and then they took his servants and treated them spitefully I, uh, that shows what they really thought about the king slew them when the king heard thereof he was wroth he sent forth his armies destroyed those murderers burned up their cities there will be a judgment it does not matter that they avoid it and run from it, and hide from it. It does not matter. There will, there is a day coming. Turn to Luke chapter fourteen. See the same story. You share the gospel with them. They say, I, you know, that's you're just dividing and troublemaking. I don't want to hear that. That's just trouble. That's just this. That's just. They have a. The Rodney King, uh, the Rodney King attitude. You don't know who Rodney King is. Rodney King, you younger kids, uh, was a <coughs> citizen of Los Angeles, and uh, he was kind of a drug user. And the cops chased him down, and uh, got rough with him. And it was all on video, so the people, the good citizens of LA, saw that. And those that were his color took offense to what happened to him, and they rioted. There was a burn; it burned buildings down everywhere. And finally, this Rodney King got on the 
got on TV, uh, and I think he had been doing PCB or math or something. So he was pretty crazy when he when they busted him. But he made a comment. All he could say was he wasn't a, he wasn't a, a well educated man. I think he meant well, but he said, "Can't we all get along?" And I think that's the way the world thinks about things. You know, can, these this this religion just divides. Let's see. I don't either. I don't want to hear about it. Or let's just say we can all get along. It's all the same. And the problem is Christ didn't say it was the same. The Christ of God made the distinctions. The Christ of God challenged the Pharisees. The Christ of God said to the Pharisees, you're of your father the devil. That's not a very nice thing. That's not a very nice thing. Um, and you could go on and on. Jesus was constantly challenging the orthodoxy of the day and what people were believing. And his people, like Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you because they're going to be, uh, believers will be of the same mind, of the same challenges to, to the world. And so in Luke 14, you see this same uh, thing played out, a little different version of it in, in verse uh, 16, where it says this, uh, uh, the man made, a certain man made a great supper, he bade many, sent his servants, uh, he says everything's ready. They all with one consent began to make excuses. The first said, I bought a piece of ground, got to go see it. Have me excused. Another said, I bought a five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. Have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. I think that's a religious reason, because uh, religious custom, you have to be with your wife, and you have to be alone with her at such and such time. And So he's kind of playing the religious card. I can't come because i got these religious things going on. So the servant came and told the Lord these things, and then, and the good news for you and I <laughs> is those that were bidden, and that would be, in this case, the Jewish nation. Those that were bidden won't come. And in verse 21, so, so the servant showed the Lord these things. The master of the house, being angry, said, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the hither, hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it's done as thou hast commanded, and yet there's room. And, uh, and the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to, co to come in that my house may be filled. That's your great hope. That's the great hope of every sinner that ever walked the face of this earth. That God has said, Go out and find those poor, maimed, blind fools. Bring them in. Even if you have to compel and drag them in, bring them in. Because my house will be filled. And it will be filled because it's ordered and sure. Everyone that he died for, everyone that he set aside in the, before the beginning of time will hear this gospel and they will come. Um, but the world goes on in Proverbs 22 um, they go on about their ways willingly ignorant In Proverbs 22, and and, uh, and you might turn to Proverbs 1 while you're at it. Uh, put a finger in that one. There's two verses in Proverbs that also speak to this situation. In Proverbs 22 and verse 3, it says, The prudent man foresees the evil, hides himself. The simple pass on and are punished. The simple are going to go on. They're going to go ahead and continue on in their ways. I don't want to know. I want to imagine. It's all going to be fine. They're not going to address this Lord Christ. They don't want to. They don't want to hear this gospel. It only offends. In Proverbs one twenty two, you see the same thing, only more clearly. It says, "How long will you simple ones? Will you love simplicity?" It says, um, "And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge." They don't want to know of this Lord Christ. That, that word simplicity there is really interesting. It says, how long will you love simplicity? That means, how long will you be naive about the scripture? How long will you be seducible by other gospels? Is what is, The word there, uh, simplicity, is, is a Greek word that means seducible, uh, open-minded. You know, there's a certain sense where open-mindedness is not good. Their open-mindedness is the tale, is, is Eve's open-mindedness. Go ahead and tell me more about that other gospel that suits my flesh a lot better. I'm interested in that thing. And that's the simplicity of those that are going to walk on and hate. They're going to hate knowledge. Knowledge being the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
okay, and the hope that's in Christ Jesus. So, so what do we conclude from all this? Number one, that the believers can rest. It's ordered, it's sure, there's a certain end to this. There's a certain eternal end where this is all going to be wrapped up and time will be no more. Uh, in Hebrews 7.25 it says, He's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he, that's Christ, ever liveth to make intercession for his people. It's ordered and sure believers can rest in the work of Christ, not looking to themselves to add anything to it, knowing that he can't take anything away from it. It's all, uh, it's been accomplished. It was accomplished at Calvary. And when he rose from the dead, okay, and his, his resurrection being our, our uh, redemption. So the believers can praise God because our God isn't helpless. He isn't needy. He isn't wondering what you'll do. He doesn't, he's not frustrated about what you did do or didn't do. He's the Lord God Almighty. In Deuteronomy 32, 31, uh, turn there, because I love this verse. It's just, it's the sweetest thing. Deuteronomy 32, uh, if you look at verse 4, it says, He's the rock, His work is perfect, and all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. Just and right is He. Uh, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of His children. They are a perverse and crooked generation, speaking of, of those rebels. But jump down to verse 31, where he says, For their rock is not as our rock, as speaking of the God of this world. It's not like our rock. Even our enemies themselves being judges. The world knows this Christ is not their Christ. They know it. They know it. You share it with them. Share it out of love and care. It's cool. I had one kid, I was sitting down with a college kid one day. And he started going on with some stuff, and I got a chance, by the grace of God, to share the gospel with him. It just came. He wanted to know, and, you know, it says, be ready to give an answer to every man that asks. And I think I was ready to answer, so he asked. And I remember him saying, making a comment. He says, he felt like the windows were getting blown out of the room. It was just like, it was just like this was more than he could bear. It was just too much. It was, it, you know, it's, he, it just blew him away. This was the God of God. And he'd grown up, in, of course, in southern stuff, and not what he'd heard before. Um, those of this world, as, so in conclusion, uh, believers can praise him. They can praise him in the worst of circumstances. They can praise him in the best of circumstances. Because they know that there's a, the Lord God is not asleep. He's not, he's not uh, off the job. He's not on vacation. He's there. He's omnipresent and moving everything according to his own good purpose and will. And believers can rest in that, no matter what the situation. Those of this world, as it says in Psalm 94, 7, you don't need to turn there, but they, they, they think that uh, the Lord doesn't see it. It says, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the Jacob, God of Jacob regard it. They're going to receive the due reward of their deeds. Their willing blindness, and they're running from the gospel, and they're, uh, that doesn't, it, they'll receive the due reward of their deeds, which is what they want. They, they believe they've earned something, and uh, that's between them and God. That's between them and God, and they, it'll be as it was with, uh, as uh, in the New Testament when they said, uh, "Lord, haven't we done this and this and that?" And the Lord will say, "Depart from me, I never knew you." That's their fate. So be advised. Turn to Acts in Latin closing. We'll go to Acts 4, then Acts 17. In Acts 4, it says, picking up on the earlier part of the verse that was that uh, Chuck read, 
Verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And then turn to Acts 17. Where he says in verse 31, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, what does that repentance mean? It means turns away from their trust in themselves, turn away from this idea that I've been a pretty good guy, therefore God's going to take me, rather than I'm, I'm, a, I'm a helpless sinner, unable to do anything about my plight, which is the truth. Turn from the notion that you can please God outside of Christ, please God based on what you do, Rather, uh, repent from that idea because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. If you don't have righteousness, forget about it. You will suffer the wrath of God eternally because that's the way he's going to judge the world. It's going to be in righteousness. If you don't stand perfect, you're in a hell of a mess. You are in a hell of a mess. It's going to be that righteousness by that man whom he has ordained Whereof he's given assurances unto all men in that he raised this feller from the dead. And we know who that was. That was the Lord Christ himself. And all things are ordered and sure in this God's universe. He will save his people from their sins. That's a great hope. If you're a sinner, there's a great hope for you. Because he said, go out and get everybody. The poor, the maimed, the halt. Everybody that's basically utterly hopeless and helpless. That's who he's got the call out to. May that be you.